Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. These were reportedly the final words said by Jane Stanford, quote, I have been poisoned. This is a terrible death to die. Jane Stanford, who lived in a mansion on Knob Hill in San Francisco, was murdered by poisoning in Hawaii in 1905. She, along with her husband, Leland Stanford, founded Stanford University. Leland Stanford himself, long dead by the time of Jane Stanford's murder, was a railroad tycoon and former governor of California and a senator. My guest today argues that there were many who wanted Jane Stanford dead and even more who wanted to help cover it up. The case has been never officially solved. The story of her murder is also about power and wealth in the Gilded Age. My guest for this conversation is Richard White. He is the author of the book, Who Killed Jane Stanford? A Gilded Age Terror of Murder, Deceit, Spirits, and the Birth of a University. Richard White is the Margaret Byrne Professor of American History Emeritus at Stanford University. Richard White, it is my good pleasure to welcome you to this program. I'm glad to be here, Mitch. Thanks. We're obviously going to also, this is also a history of Stanford University itself. So let's begin there. Stanford's founded in 1885, again, by both Jane and Leland Stanford in the memory of their son, who we'll talk about in a moment. But I just want to begin, because I think this is important to know about Stanford University at this time in almost, what, the first half of its existence up to now, Stanford is not this powerhouse university that we'd recognize today. Now, Stanford's a... um West Coast Liberal Arts College, for all practical purposes, would be the equivalent today of the Claremont Colleges. Um, I, it's it's not a major research university, though it aspired to be a major research university, and it's also reputed at the time to be the wealthiest university in the country, and indeed it will become one of the wealthiest universities in the country once Jane and Leland Stanford are dead. But until then. <laughs> The endowment that they can that the university controls is relatively small, and for all practical purposes, Jane Stanford owns Stanford University, and the older she gets, the more she acts as if everybody in that university is her employee, and so, in a sense, they work. So you already put a clue out there, uh, become a wealthier school after Jane Stanford's death. Um, but really, the, the Stanford that we'd recognize today doesn't really come about until about, what, the, the 1950s, sort of the Cold War? Yeah. It's a creation of the federal government. It comes after World War II, and it's pretty much when um, Stanford turns heavily towards technology and engineering. I mean, not science, but technology and engineering. And it manages to tap a lot of Cold War money, which is going into research, and that's what makes it a major school. Um, before that, no, it's, it's pretty much, as I say, a, a local regional um, college. Give me some context in understanding the Stanfords. And let, let's begin with Leland Stanford, um, really powerhouse figure in California history, even though I bet, I suspect most people don't know who Leland Stanford was. Yeah, that's, that's the irony. Most people would not know the name Stanford except for the university. Um, but Stanford was one of the big four, as they were called at the time, the people who founded the Central Pacific Railroad, which in turn became the Southern Pacific Railroad, um, and was one of the major corporations at the time. Um, you know, Leland Stanford Sr. Um, was powerful largely because he was partners with powerful men, particularly Collis P. Huntington. Huntington came to despise Stanford, thought he was incompetent, self-indulgent, um, and not the sharpest tool in the shed. And there's a lot of evidence that goes towards that. But Stanford and his partners had merged their money and once they merged their money together in these corporations, and these com com corporations were fairly shady in their financial dealings, there was no way they could ever get rid of each other. Um, and they stayed partners until they gradually died off. It's interesting. I, I oftentimes, and I, I like talking about the, the history of the railroads and the rail industry in this period of time, and oftentimes compare it to this very moment in time with the tech industry and the, and the tycoons of the, the tech industry. And of course, Stanford is a part of this story, this modern story of the tech industry, but Leland Stanford uh, was very much a part of this previous uh, railroad industry uh, yeah, period and of time. And the, and the, the parallels are, are very, very strong. I mean, one of the things that struck me about the railroad corporations, it's going to be relatively late in their existence before they make a lot of money. But they, these guys pioneer um, corporations which themselves lose money, very often lose their stockholders' money, very often fail to pay their debts, and yet make the people who run them immensely wealthy. And that's the story of the Central Pacific and Southern Pacific. 
and, and the railroads changed life sim- in similar ways. I mean, obviously very different things, but in similar ways as, as the internet and the tech industry has changed life today. It made yeah, everything I mean, acceptable, uh, accessible. Yeah, one of the th- things that they do is that once they're there, it's impossible to imagine life without them. Um, you might hate the people who run them. You might be frustrated by them, but there is no going back. And and the railroads in that way were transformative. Um, and the people who run them know that, and they are able to make a great deal of money because of that. Would we would we consider uh, Leland Stanford to be one of the robber barons? And and what does that mean? I know this. You're a history of this period. Yeah, I, you know, I always try to avoid using robber barons. They're certainly going to be called that. And the reason I avoid using it is the robber barons make it sound as if these guys are competent. Um, no, these guys aren't competent. <laughs> these guys are very very rich. And they're very, very corrupt, and they're able to bring in subsidies and get away with things that should have placed them in a penitentiary. But is, are they adroit businessmen? No, most of them aren't. If they're adroit businessmen, their companies would not have gone bankrupt as often as they do. These railroads go bankrupt constantly. Very often, they provide very poor service. They're overly competitive. They've overbuilt them. So they're rich, um, and they're robbers. But the Barron's part, um, I think that, that connotes the kind of power and a kind of intelligence that most of them did not possess. It gives them too much credit. Too much credit, yeah. Instead of landing in a penitentiary, Leland Stanford lands in the governor's office. He lands in the governor's office. And again, he has a very mixed record there. Leland Stanford was essentially a a saloon keeper who's in partnership with um, Carlos P. Huntington, Mark Hopkins, and Charles Crocker. And what they do is decide it'd be useful to have one of them heading the Republican Party and running the government in Sacramento. And that gets Leland Stanford made um, governor. Before that, his his, um, attempts at local office had been travesties. He loses by thousands and thousands of votes. But he ends up being governor. And as governor, he's a Republican. um, And he's Republican during the Lincoln administration. So that gives him certain power. But mostly what he's increasingly being remembered for now that was glossed over is Stanford is in charge of a a policy towards Native Americans in California, which I do not use the word genocide loosely. I don't think most American Indian policy was genocidal. California was genocidal. And um, Leland Stanford was the one who really administers that. I think of of Benjamin Medley's book, uh, American Genocide, that lays out that And that's the one that really drives that home. Yeah. And and Leland Leland Stanford is, is an important player in this history. He is because he's the one who essentially does what he often does. He gets money that finances bounties and that equips what are essentially Indian hunters, disguises them as if they're the California militia. Disguises is probably too strong. They were the California militia, but they were also Indian hunters. And um, presides over what is going to be this sort of genocidal campaign of violence um, that goes on into the 1860s. Do you think this is his legacy as governor? It, it's really hard to get around it. People try to um, move around it in other ways, but um, mostly people say, well, he kept California in the union and he was governor while California stayed in the union. That's true, but you, you can't gloss over this other part of it. Obviously, our conversation is going to be focused more on Jane Stanford than Leland Stanford, but of course, Jane Stanford's there for all of this. Is she, what, what, how would you describe, you know, we, we'll, we're going to talk about Jane Stanford as, as sort of basically owning Stanford University and being in control of Stanford University after Leland Stanford dies. But is it, what's, there, what's important to know about Jane Stanford before this period? Before this period, I mean, both Jane and, and Leland Stanford have um, modest education. So there are people founding a university who are not highly educated people. And Jane Stanford will actually stay in New York for a couple of years while Leland goes west with the gold rush, starts his businesses in Sacramento and only come out after that. Um, she is a woman who never expected to find herself wealthy, but she found herself wealthy. She's also a woman who never expected to have a child because they tried to have a child, but it's only relatively late in their marriage that she conceives Leland Stanford Jr. And at that point, she becomes a, a doting mother, um, that Leland Stanford Jr. is a precocious child. He's spoiled. They take him to Europe. He meets the Pope. He meets French artists. Every sort of whim he has has is indulged. And so she focuses her life on that child. And the really affecting thing about Jane Stanford 
is the grief, the overwhelming grief when Leland Stanford Jr. dies. Um, it looked as if it would kill both her and Leland. And what they recover from that is their ideal that their son has died and Leland Stanford Jr., which you come to later, um, appears in his father's dream. And the end outcome of all of this is going to be the founding of, of Leland Stanford Jr. University. But there's no understanding Jane Stanford without the birth of Leland Stanford Jr. And there's also um, no understanding Stanford University without that sort of legacy. And, and one of the most revealing questions I ever had for from an undergraduate when I was teaching at Stanford, I used to give these campus tours, um, was she asked as we were down at the mausoleum, the tomb where all three are buried, she asked if Leland Stanford Jr. had been a girl rather than a boy, would there be Stanford University? And I thought about it and I thought, no, it, it wouldn't. Stanford University would vanish from the landscape. It'd just be another tract of suburbs stretching south from San Francisco because what Leland Stanford Jr. did was allow the Stanford name to go on. And that is one of the things that comes out of this. Stanford's are remembered because of the university and the university is only remembered because having Leland Stanford Jr. there is the, the legacy that they were going to have, um, if he had lived, would have been, he would have gone on to inherit the corporations, but instead he becomes the namesake of the university. And, and the actual name of the university is Leland Stanford yeah, Junior yeah, University. People forget it all the time. It's Leland Stanford Junior University. He dies at 15, uh, at the right. age of 15, typhoid fever, I think. Yeah, which um, is common at the time. It's interesting, and I think it's an important distinction. It's not that the Stanfords wanted to create a university and now we're naming the university after their son who had died. They created the university because their son had died. They created it because their son had died. And beyond that, because their son appeared to Leland Stanford Jr. Leland Stanford Sr. in a dream. Um, the, the association of Stanford with ghosts, with spiritualism, is very, very strong. And that Leland Stanford Jr. would continue to send messages, according to his mother, up until her death. So Stanford University, Stanford, Leland Stanford Junior University is inspired by a dream of, from a dead person, and it will continue to be run on the advice of dead people. First, Leland Stanford Junior, and after that, Leland Stanford Senior. Jane Stanford says she consults with them regularly. She, she, she's a spiritualist. She's a spiritualist, and the, the essence of spiritualism in the late nineteenth century, and it comes out of its strength, is because of the the number of children who die. I mean, it's mostly focused on the death of children, not a death of adults. So, if a husband or wife or a lover dies early, they too will will appear. But it's mostly children, and this immense grief finds its outlet in spiritualism. And what spiritualism amounts to in the late nineteenth century is the ability to communicate with the dead. Um, that's that was the essence of it. And she is consulting both with her son and her husband, who by this time, is, they're both dead, uh, about getting consultation on how to run the university. You, you already said that. I just really want to hammer this point because it's not what you usually think of by, with Stanford University. No, mo you don't think of most universities as run by ghosts, but um, Stanford University is run by ghosts. And it makes Stanford an object of ridicule to the great embarrassment of its president, David Starr Jordan, because... While spiritualism is strong, it is also the source of a great deal of controversy and a great deal of ridicule. So there is, among other colleges and universities in the United States, a great deal of derision about Stanford University. It's seen as something of an outlier and as an embarrassment. And the things that happen there, other universities try to say, no, no, that's not how we work. This is a very peculiar place. And they were right. It was a very peculiar place. Stan Stanford, what, 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 what's... Stan what's Stanford, the university today, what, what's its creation story? How does it tell its the story? Um, the creation story erases everything I've just told you. The creation story is that um, Leland and Jane Stanford will keep this part. They'll keep the part that they were overwhelmed at the grief of their son. And what they decide to do is that since they no longer have a child, they're going to devote their fortune to the good of the children of California. And the good of the children of California is going to be to start a university which will endow with their fortune. And that Stanford uses this as a way, essentially, not to be too crass, but it's crass enough, is as a fundraising opportunity. 
Stanford's give the example of what you should do with your money. You should take the money, you should leave it for this larger good. The money goes into the university, which has now risen to be one of the great universities in the world. And the story is told as a sort of inspiration to donors um, as to the proper use of fortunes. I mean, it's sort of Andrew Carnegie, Gilded Age stuff. But in fact, that's not really what Leland Stanford did with his fortune, but that's that's a story I imagine we'll come to. But they've, they've suppressed the rest of it. Actively suppressed or? Um, yeah, I, I, they actively suppressed. The, um, the cover-up of Jane Stanford's death is going to be orchestrated by the university. They have never in 100 years since then um, talked about um, what happened to Jane Stanford and their own efforts in making sure that they had a very different version of what went on. Um, and they never really talk about the problems with early Stanford's endowment or its um, very mixed record towards academic freedom. I feel like at this point I better ask you about the death and the murder. <laughs> uh, she, there, there was actually, she, so she, she, was, she died of poisoning in 1905 in Hawaii. She was on her way to, to Japan, but there's actually a previous attempt on yeah. her life. Yeah, she's, she's on her way to Japan because somebody tried to poison her in San Francisco. Um, she had gone to bed in her mansion in um, on Knob Hill, which she shared with her servants and with Bertha Berner, who was her personal secretary and companion. Um, and somebody put uh, rat poison, which contains strychnine, in her Poland Spring bottled water. Whoever was doing it was not very good at, a poison, at being a poisoner because they put too much in. Um, she immediately gagged, began to throw up, um, called in the maid, they washed it out, got her to vomit. Um, so the first poisoning is going to fail. She doesn't even initially know that it's been poisoning, but they send it out to have the water analyzed and it comes back saying, um, yeah, somebody has just put a copious amount of, of rat poison into your Poland Spring bottled water and somebody was trying to kill you through strychnine poisoning. Um, at that point, what they're going to do is they're going to call in private detectives. They never go to the police. And that's common in the Gilded Age. Hmm. The idea is, is to cover up the scandal to make sure this doesn't get to the newspapers, which works for a few weeks. But after that, it gets into the papers. And also to conduct a private investigation to try to find out who had put the poison in the water. Um, Meanwhile, they decide that it's unsafe for Jane Stanford to stay in San Francisco. So she decides to go to Japan, stopping off in Hawaii. And among people close to her, she's very open about what's happened to her. We have it in letters about what, what's happened to her. Um, but it's still kept secret. It'll only come into the papers after she's departed. And then she'll go to Hawaii. In Hawaii, she takes Bertha Burner and another maid, not one of the old maids from the... Um, from her mansion with her. And after about a week in Hawaii, she um, goes out, has a picnic, comes back, has a light supper, is tired, asks Bertha Burner to give her some bicarbonate of soda um, and some medicine before then. Bertha Burner measures out the bicarbonate of soda. Um, she doesn't take it right away. She goes to bed. Um, and in the middle of the night, they hear her screaming for help. She has taken the bicarbonate of soda and as it will turn out, there is strychnine in the bicarbonate of soda. But this isn't rat poison. This is pure strychnine, which is very, very hard to get. Given in a quite precise dose, if it had worked perfectly, and it nearly does, it would have been just enough to kill her, but it would have left no trace in the bicarbonate, and that ways for they would have no reason to test the body to see what had happened to her. But um, this one works. She dies, as she says, a terrible death because death by strychnine poisoning is an incredibly painful death. And one of the things that comes with it is you are acutely aware of what's happening to you. So Jane Stanford knows she's been poisoned, um, and as she says, it's a terrible death to die. Yeah, that, that's why I said in the introduction, she's quoted to have said, "I have been poisoned. This is a terrible death." that I, when I was writing that out, you know, you're always trying to come up with a little clever intro to grab people's attention. I, I was wondering, I wonder if this is apocryphal that she said this. No, no. no, she, no there exactly there she are did. numerous witnesses to her saying that. And like you, I usually say that's too good a thing for them to say, but no, that's, that's what she says. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Richard White. Richard White is the author of the book, Who Killed Jane Stanford? A Gilded Age Tale of Murder, Deceit, Spirits, and 
and the Birth of a University. Richard White is the Margaret Byrne Professor of American History Emeritus at Stanford University. Um, so, so you mentioned two maids that traveled with her from San Francisco to Honolulu, one of them named Bertha Berner, who plays a big part uh, in this story. I guess it would just, and there's many people who are suspected of this murder, and you go through it all, and we'll, we'll span through that. But it, it just, on the face of it, well, Bertha Berner basically was the only person who was with Jane Stanford, both in San Francisco when she was poisoned the first time, and then the second time in, in Honolulu. Yeah, Bertha Berner, um, she's she's not a maid. She's really more of a secretary and companion. Um, and things look bad for Bertha Berner uh, when, when you're the only person present at both poisonings. But the argument that's made, and it's made by the president of the university, by members of the boards of trustees, uh, by even some members of the Stanford family, they said, well, Bertha Berner would have no motive for killing her. She and Bertha Berner had been together since Bertha Berner was 19 years old. Um, Bertha Berner had served her faithfully her whole life. Um, Bertha Berner stood to get far more money by having Jane Stanford alive than she'd ever get by Jane Stanford dying, um, that there was simply no rational reason for Bertha Berner to really kill what, as they regarded it, the goose that laid the golden egg, um, that she would be better off just accompanying Jane Stanford. Um, you know, as I did more research, I found out virtually everything about that story was wrong. Um, but that was the reason it was given at the time. It was just saying there had to be a motive, and this is the person with the least motive of anybody involved, even though they admit she's there both times. Didn't Ber Bertha Berner also go on to write a biography about Jane Stanford? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the major sources about Jane Stanford. And Bertha Berner will write this in the 1930s. You know, this is 30 years after everything happened. And the, the biography is actually one of the things that gave me a lot of my clues to unraveling the mystery. And it's not that Bertha Berner lied. There are times where she'd lie. It was that things that Bertha Berner never talked about at all. And the, and the worst thing you can do with the historian, um, and like the probably the worst thing you can do with the detective, is to not say something that's critical to the story. Once you start leaving out things they can find independently, then you can begin to suspect the whole story and begin to wonder why are you leaving things out. So the Bertha Berner biography was immensely useful to me, not so much for what she said, but what she re refused to talk about. I mean, this whole story is strange. I mean, we, we, we began with the naming of Stanford University after Leland Stanford Jr. Uh, and then Jane Stanford communing with the dead to get consultation on how to run the university. And now we're talking about a potential person who committed murder, then writing the biography about that person. <laughs> no, it, it's not the usual thing murderers do. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's, it's it would have been by this time, it's 35 years later. Um, you know, I, I don't know what her motive for doing it was. By then, the people she cooperated with are largely dead. Maybe she did it for the money. But, you know, in 1935, writing a biography of a woman most everybody has forgotten about is not going to bring in the big bucks. And as far as I know, this one never did. So, I, you know, part at some level, this story wouldn't let her go, even though um, she would. She was now not going to be investigated, nor was anybody else, because the university had said Jane Stanford had died of natural causes. Why go back and bring all this stuff up again? But she does. When you say the university helped cover up the 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 the, the murder. You're really talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but David Starr Jordan, who's the school's first president. Yeah. Um, what happens is once the once they've had strychnine poisoning in Hawaii, they have a coroner's jury. They convene a coroner's jury. And the coroner's jury, um, and they also do an autopsy, and they find traces of strychnine in her body. They find traces of strychnine in the bicarbonate of soda. Um, and the coroner's jury decides she had died of strychnine poisoning at the hands of person or persons unknown. Um, Hawaii at that time is a long way away from San Francisco. It takes several days to get there by steamship, and the steamship actually that David Starr Jordan is traveling on doesn't have radio contact, so he doesn't even know about the coroner's jury verdict until he gets there. 
As soon as he gets to Honolulu, he will set about, even as he denies he's setting about doing anything except retrieving the body, to um, overturn the coroner's verdict. He can't do that legally, but what he will do is use the Stanford Alumni Network to hire a doctor, Dr. Ernest Waterhouse, who um, he makes a deal with that he will re-examine the evidence around Jane Stanford's death. And to be clear here, Waterhouse never um, examined the body, did not take place in the autopsy. He did not attend the coroner's jury when they were looking at the body. He never had any direct examination of the bicarbonate or anything associated with the death, nor did he consult with any of the physicians, all of whom decided she had died of strychnine poisoning. He comes up with his own theory, and his theory was that um, she had gone out, she was an elderly woman, she had gone out on a picnic and overexerted herself, even though the day was 72 degrees and she rode a carriage all the way out there. She had eaten too much at lunch. The lunch had then given her gas. The gas had created pressure on her heart, and um, the pressure on her heart had then led to about bout of hysteria, which had triggered a heart attack, and she had died. Um, by Waterhouse's theory, a fart would have saved her. I mean, all she had to do was release the gas. It's an absolutely ridiculous theory, which has no other um, support from anybody else. But that's what David Starr Jordan says has happened. He said it's a natural death. He said he can't do anything in Hawaii because they have their own stuff. When he gets back to San Francisco, he will release the Waterhouse report. He'll consult with the police. He'll consult with San Francisco officials. And within 24 hours, they say she died of natural causes. And that's that. But the police in Honolulu were very clear that they thought this was a homicide. Yeah. This was a homicide. Yeah. But they, the thing is, Honolulu is a, a territory at the time. It's underfunded. One of the great fears in Honolulu is they're now going to have to have a murder trial of um, somebody who was very, very prominent. It's going to be bad publicity and very, very um, expensive. They say this is San Francisco's problem. This is a problem that came over with her on the ship. It started in San Francisco. Let the San Francisco police investigate it. So they were more than willing to wash their hands of it. But they never expected that, in fact, she would be said to have died a natural death. This is a story that is also about San Francisco, Gilded Age San Francisco. We think of Stanford University in Palo Alto, but they, they lived in San Francisco. Leland Stanford was a, a, a significant figure in, in San Francisco. Yeah, he, he was. I mean, Leland Stanford um, had his mansion in San Francisco. He was a he controlled San Francisco politics in many ways until his death. Um, and the people he'd worked with still controlled San Francisco politics until the roof machine, the labor machine, pushes them out. He's he's critical to the running of San Francisco, which is one of the most corrupt cities in in the United States. And the other thing we forget, too, is that um, it was easier to get from Palo Alto to San Francisco in 1900 than it is now, um, because the railroad service is one thing the railroad did. No Caltrans. The trains would take you there in about 20 or 30 minutes, and they ran all the time. So Palo Alto and San Francisco are very, very tightly um, linked. So, so that you could get back and forward quite easily. Oh, yeah, very no easily. Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I misunderstood what you said there for a moment, but yeah. Oh, no, no it's, it's the link is there. I mean, James Stanford would regularly, um, at least on Sundays, um, get up in San Francisco and go to Palo Alto to, to attend um, services in the Memorial Church at Stanford. You, you write that the corruption that Leland Stanford would help bring to San Francisco would inevitably, the same type of corruption would play a big role in why the San Francisco police did not properly investigate her murder. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the ironies of the case. I mean, Leland Stanford um, corrupted politics in California and San Francisco. Um, and he's, you know, he's widely denounced for it, him and, him and Huntington. It's, it's recognized at the time. But I think never in his wildest dreams did he think that the kind of corruption he'd unleashed would enable the covering up of the murder of his wife. Um, but that's going to be the irony of it, because the, the police who had been more than willing to suppress labor, the police who had been more than willing um, to cover up crimes to, as long as if they were involved with those who were rich and powerful, suddenly are more than willing to um, cover up a crime that's connected with Stanford University. Um, and that's, you know, that that's one of the great ironies of the whole story to me. Why do so many people want Jane Stanford dead is this because she's just a, a terrible person to be around is it other interests um you know i never knew jane stanford but all i can say is that 
There were a lot of people who hated her, who were very close to her. She treated everybody as if they were an employee, and really she treated them as if they were a servant. You know, as Bertha Berner, who um, was with her for a very long time, one of the things Bertha Berner said is that she ruled through her money. She had no illusions about the power her money gave her, and she intervened in people's lives constantly in order to get what she wanted. And as she became more and more religious and more and more puritanical as she got older, very often the people she was reacting against would be other less powerful women, women like Bertha Berner, women like her female servants, women like the um, undergraduate women at Stanford University. Um, she, is, she is somebody who um, intervenes in other people's lives and things that we would think were none of the, our, her business. And people at the time did too. She was extraordinary. This isn't on my imposing modern standards on Jane Stanford. It's the people at the time thought this was an extraordinary way to act. And, you know, on the university side, she did the same thing. She intervened in academic affairs. She intervened in what could be taught, how it was going to be taught, what university faculty could say, what they couldn't say. Um, that she was somebody who um, put her finger in every pot. And um, very often um, she got a great deal of resentment for it. There was also interest by the university that it was a natural death and rather than seen as a suicide because the universe the money is, is a big part of this and the money that Jane Stanford had that would go to uh, Stanford University after her death is, is a major part in this. Tell, tell me about that dynamic. Yeah, I mean, the, the major reason Stanford um, University will intervene is that Jane Stanford's death by murder threatens to have a trial. And if there's a trial, it's going to throw open all of the difficulties around the endowment of the university and what Jane Stanford wanted to do with her money and her will and in the various trusts that she established. None of that can be good news for Stanford University. There's a, a trustee named George Crothers who had done spent much of his life trying to protect the university, and he saw this as a disaster. So if, if that happens, a trial is going to be disastrous. But equally disastrous is going to be suicide, because suicide in the early 20th century means that the person who committed suicide was not in their right mind, that they, that they in fact were mentally unstable. And if you're mentally unstable, then all the legal documents you're signing are going to be um, suspect, particularly if stories come out that you're signing these documents on the advice of ghosts, and to put it mildly, ghosts lack legal standing. This is not going to work for Stanford either. So the best thing they can get out of this is not suicide, certainly not murder, but she died a uh, natural death. And George Crothers, one of the things he's going to do is sketching the edge of the law, is going to rust her doc rush her documents through probate. There's never going to be a full probate. There's never going to be a full examination. And he's going to get them through because the last thing in the world, George Crothers, who's a trustee, wants to see is any examination of the financial affairs of Stanford University. In your investigation in this, do you is there anyone who ever comes out and says, hey, this is crazy. This <laughs> this was a murder and, and we need to treat it like this. Yeah, the, the people who say it are going to be in Hawaii. Um, the people who are going to say it are going to be Fremont Older, who's a crusading newspaper editor in um, San Francisco, who says this 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 whole thing reeks to high heaven. This is what's going on here. I can't tell you exactly what happened, but I do know this investigation is a sham. And the other one is going to be George Crothers, but he will only say it privately. I mean, George Crothers will admit until um, the 1950s that Jane Stanford was murdered. He puts it in his correspondence. But he also will say that no good can come out of examining it. Um, George Crothers will help with the cover up. So even people who knew that she was murdered, who knew the investigation was a sham, they put the greater good of Stanford University ahead of uncovering the murder of Jane Stanford. Is this kind of thing, I'm sure it's not normal because we're talking about abnormal circumstances around wealth and, and who these people even are, but sort of in, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, is, is it normal for um, homicides, you know, just sort of be like, ah, it's not that important. I mean, she's a woman. Do, do, do you think that plays a role in this? No, I don't think her being a woman played a role in it. I mean, the part that surprised me initially, poor people's deaths occur all the time. That's one of the things that people will say. Well, you know, if she'd been a if she'd been a poor woman in her 70s, nobody would pay any attention to this. But she's a very rich woman. She's one of the richest women in San Francisco. Um, 
this does happen. And the reason is, it's not that different from now. At a certain point in these Gilded Age families, the person is no longer the important thing. The fortune and the legacy is the important thing. And so what has to be protected, and this is, I think, how university officials would rationalize it. Jane Stanford is dead. No matter what else has happened, she's dead. She's not coming back. Stanford University lives on. If we investigate this, if we push this through, it can only hurt the university. And indeed, it might end the university as we know it. Because Jane Stanford, at the time of her death, was considering turning Stanford University over to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, so Stanford is very on very precarious grounds. So I think the rationale for people like Crothers was the Stanfords did at least one good thing. They established this university. We can't let this university die. And if the price is that we don't investigate Jane Stanford's murder, we'll pay the price. So it would have been like, what, Santa Clara University, which which is run by the Jesuits? Yeah, she, we would have merged it with the Jesuits. She wanted the Jesuits to come in and rule it because at the, at the end of her life, she's undergoing what's a, a sexual panic. I mean, she believes that there's going to be rampant promiscuity on campus if women are allowed to um, have the kinds of freedoms that men have on a college campus. She becomes um, terrified about um, what young women are doing at Stanford University. She tries to get rid of them. Crothers points out, no, it's written into the university's endowment that this is going to be a co-ed university. You, you can't break this contract with the state. She tries to think, well, I'll establish a separate college. Maybe I'll send them all to Mills College. And then she thinks, well, I'll just turn it over to the Catholic Church. I'll turn it over to the Jesuits. And we would run it the same way as a Catholic university. Stanford University, as you mentioned, found, was founded as a co-ed university. Was this unusual at the time? It was. Um, it, it was, and it's one of the things that Stanford, in its um, usual statements now, is very, very proud of, and rightfully so. Um, but what they didn't leave out is the middle phase of this, where Jane Stanford tries to get rid of all the women on campus. And it's and it is Jane Stanford. Um, and, you know, her, her allies in this are the Catholic Church, but it's it's Jane Stanford who's after it. And Stanford's been covering it up ever since, I mean, in, in a way, right? I, you know, cover up can be a strong word. Stanford, what Stanford does is what Bertha Burner does. They just ignore stuff. You know, if, if it doesn't fit the Stanford story, Stanford does not talk about it. Um, and that's that's the way these powerful institutions work. We're just we're not going to talk about it. We keep mentioning the Gilded Age, and sometimes I'm guilty bringing up these terms without really explaining what they are. You're a historian of, of the Gilded Age. What what is what was the Gilded Age? OK, the Gilded Age takes its um, name from a, a Mark Twain novel, which is one of the worst novels Mark Twain wrote, but it's a wonderful title. It's the, it's the Gilded Age. And what Mark Twain was referring to was the period following Reconstruction and would extend into the early 20th century. And it's a time which on the surface seems to be a period of great prosperity, great advancement, scientific and technical advancement, great growth. But if you go beneath this gilded surface, what you found is rot and corruption. So that becomes the metaphor for what's going on here. And it also means that the people who are going to symbolize the age are the gilded part. It's going to be the tycoons, the people who run these large corporations, the people who um, amass wealth on a scale that Americans never saw and would never see again until our present period, which is often called the second gilded age. It creates the um, greatest economic disparities, leaving out slavery, which is leaving out a lot in American history. Um, and so this is the this is the meaning of the term. And that means that the Stanford's are going to be wonderful symbols of the gilded part of the Gilded Age. Beneath that is going to be a state in great turmoil, a state with huge social problems, huge racial problems, um, and in which the booms that take place in the economy are going to be matched by equally um, great depressions and recessions. As a Gilded Age historian, do you think calling this moment now the Gilded Age II is an apt comparison? Yeah, it's, it's no comparison is going to be exact, but we're, we're confronting a whole set of structural problems, which are very, very um, similar to um, what went on in the late 19th century. And, you know, I could spend the rest of our time here just detailing the parallels, but the parallels are are there and it goes well beyond wealth. Why did California have to adopt adopt a constitutional amendment to make Stanford University legal? Because. 
all of the founding documents of um, Stanford University violated the, the California Constitution. I mean, Leland Stanford made the university um, a corporation that would exist in perpetuity, but Stanford, California clearly said no corporation can endure more than 50 years. Um, he wrote trusts in such a way that gave power to the trustees, which were not allowed under the California Constitution. Um, he created a governing structure, which was blatantly illegal under the California Constitution. Um, he set up financial arrangements for funding the university, which violated the California Constitution. And George Crothers, at a certain point, decided that it was far easier to change the Constitution than change Stanford University. <laughs> so that's that's what they did. Again, Leland Stanford's former governor and, and a former senator, um, he, he knows he's doing this. He just doesn't care. You know, I, I've studied Leland Stanford. Um, I don't even know what Leland Stanford understood. I mean, Leland Stanford was not the shrewdest guy in the world. What he did know, he was really rich and he was really powerful. And what the university runs into trouble for is Leland Stanford and his associates took money from the federal government alone, which they were supposed to pay back and they refused to pay it back. If you refuse to pay back the federal government, eh, how important is it that we're now violating the California Constitution? If I even know what the California Constitution says, I'm just not sure. But, it's, but he didn't know from, his, from lawyers and others who should have known that in fact what you're doing is blatantly illegal. You can't do this. You can't at least give us the pretense of drawing up um, documents founding this university which make it a legal entity. And he just didn't care, or do, do you think he, he didn't have the lawyers there? Uh, obviously, he must have had lawyers. Uh, he, had, he had lawyers there, but the lawyers there are going to be sycophants. And so, I, yeah. you know, when you yeah. go back and look at who drew up the documents, Stanford claimed credit for it, but Stanford claimed credit for everything. And Stanford was technically a lawyer, but he was a very unsuccessful lawyer and not a very good lawyer. Um, so when I look at those documents, all I can tell you is the documents are illegal. Stanford University, thanks to George Crothers, knew the documents are illegal. Um, and yet they um, persisted until Crothers convinced them that they needed to get the Constitution changed. Richard White, how, how does one go back to investigate a murder that happened some, what, 118 years ago? You know, it, it turned out to be much more difficult than I thought. And, and one of the things with my brother, um, my brother Stephen, Stephen White, is actually a crime novelist. And so he's written these sort of crime novels. And at a certain point in the story, I started consulting him, both how to construct a story, which is not going to be like a usual history, but is much more like a murder mystery. But also because I ran into a grave problem, which is um, nobody seems very interested except me in solving this murder. <laughs> so my original idea was, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back there and I'm going to find a detective or I'm going to find a private investigator. I often thought of it as, and, and indeed I, I read a lot of noir novels, I, I, you know, I'm going to find Philip Marlowe or somebody who might be a little shady, but is really interested in getting to the bottom of this stuff. And I'm just going to follow them and I'll tell the story of the person who's investigating. I never found that story. Story. You know, I, I found a guy, Jules Callenden, who's a private detective who's put in charge of the Stanford case, who cooperates with David Starr Jordan. He was hired to cover up the murder. He wasn't hired to solve the murder. And he does a pretty good job covering up the murder. I looked at the police department. The police department is people who were largely bought off. And as I say in the story, I think actually they did uncover the murder who the murderer was, and then they made sure that nobody was going to follow those tracks to uncover it themselves. Um, so with that, I had to start doing it. Uh, and, and what I began to do is just doing what detectives do or what I was told detectives do. Um, you know what, first of all, whoever did it is that they, three things you have to establish is they had to have motive. So I began to look at all the people with motives. And then it seemed to be half of San Francisco had a motive to kill her. So that really wasn't narrow. Well, Dan down. and outside of her house, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, pretty much people in the university, anybody who worked for her, um, people who she um, had financial dealings with. There were a whole series of people who had plenty of reason to be angry with. Her. But they had to have the means. And so I had to have somebody who had... Um, the means to get strychnine and getting rat poison was not much of an issue. Anybody in San Francisco could have gotten rat poison. But pure strychnine, that was hard to come by. You had to sign a poison book or you had to have inside contacts to be able to get pure strychnine. That is, that is not an easy task. So that narrowed things down more. 
And then you had to have the opportunity. You had to be there. Somebody had to physically be there to put the poison in the bicarbonate of soda, which could have happened in Hawaii or could have been placed in the bicarbonate of soda before they ever left San Francisco. Um, and then they had to, um, you know, be around as the, as the, the stuff was administered. And they didn't have to be around, but they had to have been able to, to plant the poison. So that's where I started to go. I began to investigate it by narrowing it down. Okay, who has the motive? Who has the means? Who has the opportunity? Um, and it was the kind of thing that eventually kept me up at night, um, especially during COVID, because the major mystery for me is how do you go from rat poisoning rat poison within six weeks to putting in pure strychnine in a precise dose. I was positive, for reasons I won't go into here, that it was the same person, but that person had taken a master course in poisoning in the last six weeks. So it's getting to that key, and I think I found that key, but getting to that key, at that point, I became confident that I had who the murderer was. Is this who the police thought it was? I think so. Yeah. Um, I think, in fact, the police and the private detective knew who it was, and they made sure that um, that was going no further than them. And you think this is this is a quintessential Gilded Age story that this fits into the Gilded Age? Oh yeah, this is what the Gilded the Gilded Age, you know, the Mark Twain stuff. The Gilded Age was about money. What matters in America is money. What matters in America is great fortunes. What matters in America is no longer the old sense that well, fortunes will last a generation or two or go down. Fortunes will continue to go. And in this case, there is no direct heir to inherit the fortune, but there is Stanford University to inherit the fortune, to, to create the legacy of the Stanfords. And so I think it was about protecting the money and protecting the money um, is something that certainly both politicians, the police, and Stanford University all could understand. And that, I think, is the key to what happens to Jane Stanford. Maybe even something the Stanfords themselves would understand. Yeah, I think Jane Stanford would have understood it. I mean, Jane Stanford pretty much knew the power of money. And that's the irony of the story is that Leland Stanford corrupted San Francisco and it ended up covering up the death of his wife. Jane Stanford got all of her power through her, her fortune. And her fortune is essentially what is going to make sure that nobody investigates her, her death. Richard White has been our guest. He has joined us for a conversation about his book that's now out in paperback. It's called Who Killed Jane Stanford? A Gilded Age Tale of Murder, Deceit, Spirits, and the Birth of a University. Richard White is Margaret Byrne Professor of American History Emeritus at Stanford University. Richard White, I've enjoyed the, our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you, Mitch. I enjoyed it, too.